out there. Do you hear that? Honey, it's probably just a drunken, semi-naked mock exorcism. Boys will be boys. Candidates drink from the skull. Let's say it happens, okay? My response, so what? Basically have a YouTube show uh, telling people what we're getting from the demons these days. All right, that would be fantastic. Just from a layman's perspective, it looks to me like the exorcism was a miserable failure. Tonight we're going to be looking at some controversial and even scary facts. There will be many who understand exactly what's going on, while others will need to examine the claims to come to grips with this study. Apparitions have been recorded since the beginning of time. As a matter of fact, just about every religion and mystery school has recorded a rich history of apparitions and similar occurrences amidst their practices and rituals, which has created and added to their doctrine. So what exactly is an apparition? According to Webster's Dictionary, an apparition is an unusual or unexpected sight, a phenomenon, a ghostly figure, or the act of becoming visible, making an appearance. Google's official synonyms include ghost, phantom, specter, spirit, wraith, and even chimera, literally a phantasm or visitant. That's a pretty good place to start as we understand that we're dealing with an officially documented set of events. Oftentimes, an apparition will appear and bear some kind of witness to its spectators, be it in the form of prophecy or a message. Other times, it will just be seen and worshipped or feared, for pure vanity's sake. So many different types of apparitions have taken place for thousands of years. Though it can be hard to tie many of them together in worldly terms, as we're going to see tonight, there are some that are gruesomely connected. Historically, the word showed up in Latin and English writings at an extremely high peak between 1850 and 1900. Ironically, the birth of American spiritism was dawned during that window of time. This was a time when many esoteric and mystic books and documents were published and the movement was undoubtedly preceded by the spiritist movement throughout Europe. Now in the paranormal investigation world, mankind has tried to create a categorization of these types of apparitions. Anything from residual haunts, interactive intelligence, and poltergeists, all the way to demonic apparitions and shadow people. While I can't deny the occurrences that they've recorded, they seem to have broken them into too many categories. Tonight we're going to focus on the only two real categories that actually exist holy angelic and biblical appearances versus the counterfeit version being demonic and deceptive apparitions. Unfortunately for the masses, the apparitions of our day always fail the litmus test of biblical comparison. The best way to get started in understanding the differences here is to look at the biblical accounts. By knowing the authentic, the counterfeits are easier to spot. In Genesis chapter 16, the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar. He told her the things that she must do, and even shared brief prophecies with her about her future and the future of her soon-to-be-born son. The message pointed back to the Lord as being all-knowing and providing. Then there were the two angels that visited Lot in Sodom and even stayed with him. They warned him about the coming judgment that was about to come upon the city for its great sin. They brought a message from God to make deliverance for Lot and his family to escape. Unfortunately, his wife looked back and was destroyed. Now, that's not the point here, but rather they came with a message from God, and they always pointed back to God. An angel appeared to the priest Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, whose wife couldn't bear children. The angel was Gabriel, in fact, and he brought a powerful message about the Lord providing them with a son. And it was all about God, ladies and gentlemen. It was all about God's glory and prophecies of the Bible, and no mention of anything pointing any glory to the angel himself. The fact is, I could go on about angels appearing in the Bible, but the end result was always in line with God and His Holy Scriptures. There was nothing creepy and questionable in the events of biblical visitations. The only other godly apparition scenario in the Bible, to use the world's terms, is the case found in 1 Samuel chapter 28, where Saul had visited the witch of Endor, and he attempted to raise the spirit of the prophet Samuel, who had previously died. This was a rare event in biblical history, folks, and the Lord allowed this appearance to happen just to rebuke Saul for his wickedness, and the message was that of biblical correction, and it was a declaration of the impending punishment for Saul and his sons as they would die in battle the very next day. Some would even mention the Mount of Transfiguration. We know that the glorified bodies of Moses and Elijah showed up and talked with Jesus, but we don't have too many details surrounding that conversation. Others would mention the two men-like creatures that were present at Jesus' ascension in Acts chapter 1. 
The fact is, they glorified Christ and spoke of his coming return. We can easily see a pattern here. The work of God always points back to God and him alone as supreme and only glorifies the Godhead. Never do the apparitions or appearances contradict scripture or the character of God. This is very important to recognize. Now, one last biblical account, just to set the stage of the proper way to categorize apparitions as either being godly or demonic, and this one really hits home. Revelation 19.10 makes a bold statement. While John was being given the revelation of Jesus Christ, an angel had appeared to him, and John wrote this, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that had the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. A rebuke for trying to worship the entity followed immediately, and glory was instantly pointed towards Jesus Christ Yeshua. The angel said, don't worship me. It was a rebuke, folks. The angel of God knew that he was not to be honored and worshiped. Interestingly enough, in chapter 22 of Revelation, as John was seeing more and more of God's glory in future events to come, he was overcome again, and he bowed to worship at the feet of the angel. Again he was rebuked and was told to worship God alone. You see, folks, God's messengers never allow themselves to be worshipped or honored in any means. It's all about God. The reason we need to see the biblical accounts surrounding holy appearances is so we can know the truth so well that when a counterfeit arises, we can spot it clearly. If you don't know the authentic acts of God, you will surely not be equipped in these days when so many counterfeits are prevalent. Now we're going to explore a brief history of some rather mind-blowing and freakish apparitions and so-called miracles that are being attributed to the work of God. These are absolutely paranormal and have brought many people together around the world in hopes for invoking even more future events. I have to warn you, this is about to get creepy. The Roman Catholic Church has a dark history of strange and paranormal experiences which have been attributed to the works of God. Let's take a look at some rather large-scale documented cases that are officially accepted and blessed by the Vatican. Now, I want to mention that this is in reference to the Eucharist. This has to do with their ritual of taking their communion. One Catholic ministry writes this, Throughout Christian history, our Lord has shown us that he is really present as the blessed sacrament. Now, what's wrong with this statement? Communion is a biblical act that is done in remembrance of Christ, and it's not a present reoccurrence of the crucifixion, which is firm Catholic doctrine, folks. This is one majorly misunderstood ritual which would explain some strange, unbiblical experiences that follow it. Here are a few so-called miracles officially documented. In Lanciano, Italy, 8th century AD, a priest has doubts about the real presence. However, when he consecrates the host, it transforms into flesh and blood. This miracle has undergone extensive scientific examination and can only be explained as a miracle, they say. The flesh is actually cardiac tissue which contains arterioles, veins, and nerve fibers. The blood type, as in all other approved Eucharistic miracles, is type AB. Histological micrographs are shown. Now, what we're dealing with here are miracles surrounding the ritual of their communion. That's what we're talking about here. These are officially documented miracles that have taken place in their Holy Eucharist communion ritual. They believe that the wafer and the wine, or the bread and the wine, is actually physically, supernaturally, taking on the form of Jesus Christ's flesh and blood. It's supposed to be a representation, folks, done in remembrance. This is re-crucifying Christ. Now let's move on. Bolsina or Vieta, Italy. Again, a priest has difficulties believing in the real presence, and the blood begins seeping out of the host upon consecration. Because of this miracle, Pope Urban IV commissioned the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is still celebrated today. Blano, France, March 31st, 1331. The Eucharist falls out of a woman's mouth onto an altar rail cloth. The priest tries to recover the host, but all that remains is a large spot of blood, the same size and dimensions as the wafer. Signs and wonders involving manifested flesh and blood goes back to giving credence to the attempted re-crucifying of Christ on the cross. They look at these signs and wonders as miracles, and they believe God performs these miracles to authenticate their pagan practice. It's clearly a satanic scheme. Again, Christ was sacrificed once and for all, ladies and gentlemen. These types of demonic occurrences have absolutely no correlation to the Bible or the doctrine therein whatsoever. And we could go on with these demonic miracles that have been documented by the Vatican, but we really need to jump into the visitations by the demonic entities, or the apparitions. 
The Marian apparitions of Lourdes were reported in 1858 by St. Bernadette Sobrius, a 14-year-old miller's daughter from the town of Lourdes in southern France. From February 11th to July 16th of 1858, she reported 18 apparitions of a lady. Despite the initial skepticism from the Roman Catholic Church, these claims were eventually declared to be worthy of belief after a canonical investigation is now known as Our Lady of Lourdes. On Thursday, February 11th, 1858, a week before Lent would begin, a 14-year-old Bernadette was out gathering firewood with her sister and a friend at the Grotto of Massabiel outside of Lourdes, when she reportedly had the first of 18 visions of what she termed a small young lady standing in a niche in the rock. Her sister and her friend stated that they had seen nothing. On her third visit, she said that the beautiful lady asked her to return to the grotto every day for 15 days. At first, her mother had forbidden her to go, but Bernadette persuaded her mother to allow her. The apparition did not identify herself until the 17th vision, although the townspeople who believed she was telling the truth assumed she saw the Virgin Mary. This is because Europe has a long history of Mary worship. Now, Bernadette never claimed it to be Mary, calling what she saw simply a caro, or rather, that thing. Bernadette described the lady as wearing a white veil and a blue girdle, as she had a golden rose on each foot and held a rosary of pearls. Bernadette's story caused a sensation with the townspeople, who were divided in their opinions on whether or not Bernadette was telling the truth. She soon had a large number of people following her on her daily journey, some out of curiosity and others who firmly believed they were witnessing a miracle. Lourdes became a national issue in France. On July 16, 1858, Bernadette visited the grotto for the last time and said, I have never seen her so beautiful before. On January 18, 1860, the local bishop declared the Virgin Mary did appear indeed to Bernadette. In 1958, Pope Pius XII issued the encyclical Le Perinage de Lourdes on the 100th anniversary of the apparitions. Pope John Paul II visited Lourdes three times. Pope Benedict XVI visited Lourdes on September 15, 2008 to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the apparitions. So we're seeing the Vatican not only backing these things up, but they're traveling to the sacred place where these things happened. There are some strange facts about all of this. First of all, the witnesses grew from a few to over 1,000 devout Catholic mystics gathering around to perform rituals around the entity. The young girl went through kneeling before the entity and praying her rosary before it. Another time, she showered holy water on the entity, and it brought smiles upon the entity's face. I need to go ahead and mention that nowhere in the Bible or records of the early church which was started by the apostles, is there any mention of a rosary or a set of specific religious prayers? It's interesting how the rosary has a very tight link to the alleged image of Mary throughout history. Many rosary incantations are worshiping and honoring Mary in a way that's not biblical, but this girl was taught a special prayer by the entity on the fifth appearance. By the eighth appearance, the entity was declaring everyone to perform a penance ritual of kissing the ground. Let us not forget that the grace of God is given to true believers of Christ by faith and faith alone. This demonic entity was clearly enslaving these people by acts of manipulative works in order to be forgiven of their sins. Another interesting fact, the use of carrying candles for protection was mentioned. The practice of lighting special candles for different purposes is a practice of voodoo and santeria. We learned about the botanicas, the stores that sell everything you need for voodoo and santeria. You can go to any botanical website or shop and find these types of candles with specific ritual meanings. Some even carry candles with Catholic icons on them for specific ritual use. It's not ironic to see a demonic apparition when you are among a pagan people practicing unbiblical pagan rituals and beliefs. One thing to remember about this apparition, folks, is that the entity required the girl to return back to her on a schedule for more information that would be unveiled. This is a strong connection that we're going to see in another apparition.